Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting uh, to order. Uh, uh, before I ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, I want to recognize that we've got some special guests uh, with us uh, tonight, and I'm going to ask Councillor Cazzo to do a little bit of an introduction for us. Yes, yeah, so um, last week I had the, the privilege hmm. to meet with um, the Den 5 PAC 47 troop in Scarborough and uh, we had a wonderful discussion. They asked some really hard questions, Mike, so you might want to take some lessons from these guys because they were pretty tough. <laughs> um, so um, in, in, in the usual spirit of, of community, we asked them to come and lead us in the, uh, in the pledge today and uh, their Den leader, Stephanie Leonhardt, uh, Leonhard, excuse me, is, is with them as well. So I just wanted to say thanks, guys, for coming, and, and hopefully this is uh, going to be worthwhile for you guys. And I think after the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, I'd ask if uh, whoever would like to go up and just introduce yourself at the podium and uh, give us your name, okay? So if you, want, if you want to all rise now. And Scout, why don't we have uh, walk over and surround the podium? <laughs> Front of the podium. In front. There's the flag right there. Go <laughs> set. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Who's going to be the bravest and speak first? Hi, my name is Oliver. I'm from South Portland, and my school is Kaler. Thank you. You're not giving them three minutes, are you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Shri Karthik. Um, I'm from Scarp. Okay, so twenty. My address is Twenty Pin Oak Drive, and I go to Wentworth School. Hi, my name is Leah Murphy, and I l live fi in Five May Flower Drive, and I go to Wentworth School. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nathan. I live on Black Point Road, 156, and I go to Wentworth. Hello, my name is Bryce Jackson Priest, and I go and my my home is 18 First Street, Scarborough, Maine, and and my school is Wentworth School. Hi, my name is Jeremiah Gilliam, and um, I live on Holmes Road, and I homeschool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Roll call, please. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. General public comments. Anyone uh, wishing to address the town council on any business that is not on the agenda tonight, please feel free to go to the podium, state your name and address. That would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jessica Holbrook, 137 Beechridge Road. I promise I'll try very hard to keep this to three minutes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come down tonight and uh, <laughs> And there's no special privileges, I promise. Um, I was just coming down tonight to talk about um, a recent project. Um, I, I have yes, stepped away from, from you know, the high life of council, and um, I've gone off to historic preservation. And I did want to just say we had a really successful project. It's always nice to hear when you have a council goal to be able to hear about some of the achievements that go along with that goal. So um, first and foremost, I could say we had a great project. We had a cleanup project for the King Burial Ground last weekend. And um, at first and foremost, I would love to thank just the volunteers themselves. Um, my husband so graciously um, kind of volunteered. <laughs> and 
the Green family, um, the Becky and Roger Delaware, um, Sharman Kadabit. Carmen Bitsky, I can talk. I still get nervous speaking in public. <laughs> so, um, but just a big heartfelt thank you, and absolutely, and 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 also to a big heartfelt thanks to Public Works. Um, they will be coming in now that the bulk of the cleanup has happened, which is from the street up to the knoll where the monument and the marker is for for the kings and and for the burial site. Um, Public Works will be coming in after and assisting with the, the debris removal from the pile and those sorts of things. Um, so again, I just wanted to express our heartfelt thanks. This was a great project. It was a great first project. We look forward to doing more of these projects in the future. And um, I will try very quickly just to give everybody an idea of why King Burial Ground might be an interesting place. Um, the Kings have a really rich, long history here in Scarborough. And um, from those of you that aren't familiar with them, um, the burial ground itself is for Richard King. And he was a captain, he was a merchant, he was a farmer, he was also our local magistrate, and he participated in the siege of Louisburg, which really secured um, our industry and our trade routes and those things. And then he is the, the gentleman that is buried on the knoll. It's not marked, it's just marked with the monument. And then it's a memorial to his sons. So his sons were Rufus, William, and Cyrus. And certainly Rufus um, was a very, very integral person, not only just for Scarborough, um, but he was a member of the Continental Congress, which framed our Constitution. Um, he was later a member of that, part of, of that group that ratified it later. So he is very integral in our national history. Um, certainly, William King becomes also a very well-known person. He was our first governor of Maine. Um, and then Cyrus, who has a much shorter description, but not, not any less important, was a congressman. Um, so that's just a little background of the site. It's a wonderful site. It's at the end of Susan Ave, which is off of Broad Turn Road, if you're not familiar with that. Um, we're, like I said, looking forward to, in the future, doing more of these pro projects. Um, again, volunteer-based partnerships with the town, and um, we'll be looking for nominations. If it, again, you know, this, this was certainly a site that was very overgrown. It, it was three hours to, to clean out the site with, with all us volunteers. <laughs> Uh, but we will be looking for more sites in the future and certainly volunteers. So um, if anybody is interested, um, please feel free to contact either, we'll throw the Tom, Tom under the bus, town manager, to, to let us know. And again, if you're interested in volunteering. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. And I think you probably all know uh, Jessica Holbrook, uh, uh, outstanding town council member and chair. Uh, who has now still carried on uh, as a leader on our Historic Preservation Committee for the town. Uh, uh, we have someone here from the uh, Public Library, from the Scarborough Friends of Public Library. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to handle the first matter, then introduce the resolution on the Public Library, and then ask you to uh, just give us a few words. So Sounds if you'll hold great. off for a moment, we'll, we'll cover Order number 16-63, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, Section 25. Ooh, I, no, I did. I skipped over. I think there's a few more comments. Yeah, yeah okay. Let, let me back up. Uh, anyone else for general public comments? Good evening. I'm Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive from Scarborough. Um, I want to mention something about uh, the teacher contract. I know this is not the venue for that, but the school board, unlike the town council, does not have a general comment period. You can only speak on whatever is on the agenda that night. Um, I attended the meeting on October 6th when the contract was coming up, and I had stood up and just said at the beginning that uh, I was hoping that they would have um, a discussion on the increase, either as percentage or, or dollar-wise, in the discussions. Uh, when they got to this contract, um, about the only thing that was mentioned was the COLA increases of a half a percent, one and a half for year two, and three percent in the third year. Um, we found out that um, medical insurance would be paid at 80 to 100 percent, and that six steps would be added to the um, to the agreement this time around. 
they're supposed to have tomorrow night a, a uh, analysis of this uh, contract. They voted, they voted seven to nothing uh, to approve the contract. Um, in business, that's, it's just shocking that you don't at least know, or at least it wasn't provided to the public what the cost was here, whether this thing was gonna cost us a half a million dollars, two million dollars more a year or what. And um, I, I just think that that's a, a poor way to do business. And I just wanted to share that with the, the council tonight. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to make a public comment? Yes. Hi, I'm Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I am the chair of the Parks and Conservation Land Board, but um, I'm speaking uh, as a citizen myself, but um, I also have done a lot of work with conservation and spoke with a lot of different people um, about this issue. So I can say that it's not me, all, just me that I'm speaking for. There are a lot of people that feel this way. Um, we all heard about, probably you guys have heard about, but you were not present at the presentation for the New England Cottontail that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put on recently in town hall here. Um, there were members of the Maine Audubon there, staff of the Maine Audubon, Scarborough Land Trust members, Friends of the Scarborough Marsh members, Parks and Conservation Land members. And um, while all of us support um, endangered species um, and protecting endangered species and helping endangered species, not everybody agrees with the project. And um, what was presented in the, in the paper was a little bit glossed over the concerns of the conservation community in Scarborough. And I, can, I know that if, if you take this seriously and you have conversations with the Friends of the Scarborough Marsh, members of the Land Trust, members of the Parks, and not just myself, but other people, <clears throat> we have some major concerns with the, what the, US, or the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is going to do. Um, I don't, are you guys, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of it or not. I'll pass around this map a little bit. It shows um, the clear cut area that they're going to use. The town, just a little bit of history real quick. The town spent $250,000 of our land bond money for conservation in the Jarvis property. And we, in 2008, and me being the chair, wrote a letter in support of spending that money um, to protect the land. And they're using the 65 acres of the Jarvis property for the endangered New England cottontail, which we think is which we think is fabulous, um, because that's what the land is purchased for is conservation. The part that we're concerned about is because the marsh contains a lot of other species and a lot of other important things, such as um, old growth types of forested areas. There is very few forests right adjacent to the Scarborough Marsh. The forests that they're proposing to do some of the clear cut, in addition to those 65 acres is another 23 acres, and it, it abuts the Scarborough, uh, the um, industrial park. It, it is a view corridor from Pine Point Road, as well as the marsh, to the industrial park. And it will be either a, um, part of it will be clear cut, 16 acres, part of it will be patch cut, and part of the, and it's all for biological reasons, which all makes sense and everything. Um, we, the community, the Scarborough Conservation Community, believe that 65 acres uh, using that parcel is enough. And so I think you're going to hear more. I see I'm out of time. But I think you're going to hear more from the conservation community about the fact that we would like to see the 60-year-old, 70-year-old forest uh, at least maintained a little bit more than the inland fisheries is going to. So I'll, I'll pass this around just so you guys kind of know the area. This is not great. But thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, wishing to make public comment? My name is Maura Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road, which is uh, four houses away from the new bridge that they just built mm -hmm. going down towards Pine Point Beach. Um, the bridge is awesome, but they forgot a sidewalk. I don't know where the sidewalk is. There's no sidewalk, and um, I don't. I guess they're planning on using the bike lane as a breakdown lane, bike lane, walking lane, and um, I don't know if that was a mistake or what. But 
I think it was really poor planning to build this beautiful bridge and to not incorporate a sidewalk. I was told that they didn't incorporate the sidewalk for plowing reasons, which I can understand, but um, was hoping that maybe they could put a sidewalk in on the outside of the bridge maybe, because um, in the summer there's a lot of traffic that go down to the beach. There's a lot of foot traffic, a ton of bike traffic, um, a lot of runners, people coming from Bailey's campground, and now they're going to be walking in the road with those cars. So I know this isn't who I really need to talk to about it, but I just want to put a bug in everyone's ear because I think it needs to be addressed. We need to have a sidewalk there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to address the council in public time? Those are the general public comments. Uh, minutes, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Uh, any changes, comments? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. I abstain. <clears throat> one abstention, Mr. Rowan. Uh, adjustments to the agenda, there are none. Items to be signed are the treasurer's warrants, which I will do later. Uh, order 16-63, uh, public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, Parking Restrictions, Subsection A. I'll ask the Town Manager to introduce this. Yes, this matter has been taken up by the Ordinance Committee. Um, so I think had a thorough discussion of it, passed it on to Council, and you've passed it in first reading. Essentially, it's a very simple uh, ordinance amendment to the Traffic Ordinance that would allow for three on-street parking spaces on Orchard Street, uh, that area closest to Route 1. And this is on the side of Orchard Street uh, where the Methodist Church is. Um, the town engineer was involved and in, in provided some consulting advice to the ordinance committee and has a design. All of this will be accomplished with road paint, so it's not a, a costly endeavor whatsoever. Uh, it will also give us an opportunity to better define Orchard Street as it turns the corner. If anyone's familiar with that street, fairly soon after you turn onto Orchard, it takes a fairly steep curve to the left um, and there's an open parking lot kind of on the right hand side. So we'll be able, with road paint again, create a center line and kind of a, a sideline, fog line if you will, so traffic will have a, a better sense of where they should be. Uh, the roadway width is adequate to handle these on-street spaces, so um, the church is uh, equally supported. Uh, in fact, this is what they've been seeking for some time now. Thank you. Uh, public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the council on this matter, please approach the podium. Close the public hearing. Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, as chair of the ordinance, I would uh, again uh, tell folks that this went through a thorough vetting in the ordinance committee. We passed it on the last uh, meeting, the first reading, and I uh, would encourage another uh, passage of this this time around. Other comments? Second reading. I think we're ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, and if, Thank you. Uh, if the scouts would like to head home, this would be a good time for you to uh, head out if you wish. Otherwise, you can stay and yeah. enjoy the rest of our, <laughs> our, our business meeting. Everybody Democracy in progress. <laughs> 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 and with that, yeah, not, <laughs> yeah, not a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> they have to go home Actually, and do that any one. of you need a ride home? <laughs> 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 Thank you for coming. I know, yeah. Resolution 16-007, resolution to proclaim October 16th through the 22nd, 2016, as Friends of Libraries Week in uh, Scarborough. And we have a, a representative from the Friends of Scarborough Library here uh, tonight. So I would ask uh, if you would introduce yourself at the podium. Good evening. My name is Sue Helms, and I'm president, the current president of Friends of Scarborough Library. We also have our treasurer here, Ann Janik, and of course we have our wonderful library director here, um, Nancy Kroll. Um, I've had a sneak preview, so I know what the proclamation says that you are, are going to read. Um, and I want to just 
stand up to say thank you for doing that. Thank you for acknowledging um, how much time and effort the Friends of Scarborough Library give to our library. Um, and as most of you know, we do a very large book sale in June, which we are hoping to do again this year. Um, but I'm going to put a plug in, folks. Um, most of us on the Friends of Library Board are older retired people. Um, and we really need some strong backs. We need people who can lift up boxes of books because we get loads of boxes of books donated in the lobby of the library. Bless the, the um, public works, excuse me, bless the public works because they allow us to store all of those books and sort them upstairs in their mezzanine in the um, public works department. Um, but they have to be transported from the library over there. And then um, after we start sorting them by genre in, uh, after the holidays, um, in, on Wednesdays, um, we also need people who are willing to come and lift up the, the, what, the, what we call flats of books and what they are. are if you think of um, grocery stores with displays of tomatoes and, and, and things like that, and they're on boxes about this high and about that wide. Well, you'll feel those boxes standing up with books and you've got a heavy load. Mm -hmm. And what we need is somebody, that other people who might be willing to come certain days, of certain Wednesdays of any month and help to carry those over to assemble pallets. So that's my plug along with my very, very big thank you for the acknowledgement of the work of this group. Thank, thank you. you for, uh, I'll read the resolution. Uh, National Friends of Library Week proclamation. Whereas Friends of the Scarborough Library raise money that enables our library to move from good to great, providing the resources for additional programming, much needed equipment, support for children's summer reading and special events throughout the year. Whereas the work of the Friends highlights on an ongoing basis, the fact that our library is the cornerstone of the community, providing opportunities for all to engage in the joy of lifelong learning and connect with the thoughts and ideas of others from ages past to the present. Whereas the Friends understand the critical importance of well-funded libraries and advocate to ensure that our library gets the resources it needs to provide a wide variety of services to all ages including access to print and electronic material along with expert assistance in research, readers advisory and children's services. Whereas the friend's gift of their time and commitment to the library sets an example for all and how volunteerism leads to positive civic engagement and the betterment of our community. Now therefore be it resolved that the Scarborough Town Council proclaims October 16th through the 22nd, 2016 as Friends of Libraries Week in Scarborough, Maine, and urges everyone to join the Friends of the Library and thank them for all they do to make our library and community so much better. Accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Okay, Councilor Gatorino. Uh, I, I think that's great. I know a lot of the work that the uh, friends do and have done for a number of years for our library. I know we're known as one of the best libraries in the area. So congratulations, and we're happy to recognize. We had a uh, 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 workshop with the library uh, uh, several months ago, and uh, I must say everyone on the town council was impressed by the scope of services that the library uh, offers to the public. And, uh, and I can say from firsthand knowledge that uh, lifting those heavy boxes and getting them down to DPW uh, is a task for younger people. <laughs> uh, and therefore, uh, let's hope that maybe we could find a better arrangement to be able to provide that sort of support. And I'll see what, uh, what we might be able to do in talking with maybe with the schools. Further comments? Councilor Kazem. Perhaps we dismissed the Boy Scouts too early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they needed to go home and sleep. Could be. Uh, other questions, comments? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you very much for all you do.
Old Business, Order 16-64, act on the request to accept the policy establishing a methodology for calculation of projected valuation. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Councillor Rowan first and uh, the Chair of our Rules and Policies Committee second to uh, comment on uh, this matter. If you want to uh, act as an introduction, uh, who would like to go first? Maybe I'll, I'll start it because I'm going to get out of my depth real quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so so just, just to kind of introduce this, we had talked about this and, and what every year around budget time as we look at the numbers and then we try to make some projections about what the tax rate, rate might be, um, we always have had a conversation about how do we come up with a property valuation which is a key assumption in trying to calculate that. So and this, is, this is about as deep as I can go and that's why I'll kick it to Roland. Um, <laughs> It, the will. And he this year really had a great suggestion saying, okay, so, so every year what we've done is we've, we've had a, a conservative number for the property valuation, which has driven a rate. And every year the actual property valuation has come in a little bit higher, which is a positive effect on the tax rate. So I think what we talked about doing is, gee, maybe what we should do is come up with a methodology. So at budget time, we're not debating the methodology we use to come up with the property valuation and to give a range of numbers that the tax rate might be based on sort of two sort of corridors of a conservative and maybe a more optimistic sort of valuation. And Will, you spent a ton of time doing a lot of analysis and thought and really has proposed a formula to use. And we tabled this last time because I couldn't even begin to explain it. So <laughs> Will's here to help walk us through. So, and whatever I've missed, feel mm -hmm. free to fill in and then talk, talk to us a little bit about the formula and just at a high level would be great. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm just going to back up and talk about like what, what, what the motive, to fill in a little bit of color on Peter's, on the motivation. Um, so um, the, the actual tax rate calculation is, is pretty straightforward. We take the, the tax base or the entire town-wide valuation which is the sum of everybody's property assessment um, and everybody else in town and plus whatever business uh, property there is and we add that together and that's our, that's our, uh, our town-wide valuation or our tax base. Um, and then we have a budget that we pass um, and so we get our tax rate just by taking the budget and dividing by that town-wide valuation uh, and then everyone gets a tax bill in the mail where they're expected to pay their share based on their uh, assessment. Um, so the problem is that we start talking about a budget in April um, for, the, for the upcoming year. Um, and at that time, we don't know what the valuation is going to be um, for the next year. Um, so, at that, so we use a, a number for the valuation, which is really um, just, a, again, a conservative estimate based on um, no, actually a number that we've used in, in prior years. Um, and so... Um, it becomes a somewhat of a point of controversy because we, we're just presenting a number about something that we don't know anything about. Um, and um, so the, the suggestion was that we actually look historically and we present some kind of, use some kind of average. Um, but there's a, a huge amount of volatility in this number um, because every year the, it's, it's really up to the assessor's office who's completely independent um, and he just has you know, new uh, properties, that, new construction um, that he's looking at. You know, there's new, new business that, that comes in town. Um, and he just, he comes up with his number at the end of August. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's the number that, that we use to, to figure right before the tax bills go out. Um, and so then we, we take the budget, we divide by the number that the tax assessor has come up with, and the tax bills go out. Um, but so the idea was we'll, we'll use a 10-year average um, and we'll, uh, we'll also, to Peter's point, um, give a low estimate and a high estimate based on that uh, tax, excuse me, on that 10-year average. Um, so, the, um, so the formula really works out to be take, take the average um, and it uses a formula called the, uh, the, the compound annual growth rate because mm -hmm. um, that's how, for instance, inflation is, is calculated and it, it basically means that uh, the, the prior year or the, the current year is based most uh, directly based on the prior year. Um, and then we take it and we just say, okay, well, whatever that, that, that growth number comes out to be, we'll take that average and we'll say, we'll take, we'll assume a conservative number of half of that 
and a, uh, an aggressive number of one and a half times that uh, and present a range. Um, and so the policy says just that, um, and then it also includes verbiage that, to say that it, this is not intended to influence the assessor in any way because that's a completely independent office. Um, it defines what that uh, compound growth rate formula is. Um, and then if you look back historically over the last 10 years, um, uh, it came up with, for, for in 2016, projecting forward to 2017, uh, it said the 10-year average was about $52, $52 million, um, which is actually really close to what it turned out to be for that growth. Um, and the, using our range of 50% plus 50%, um, that gives a range of uh, somewhere between $26 million and $79 million. Um, and then if you look back historically over 10 years and you say, well, how many times would we have been within that range? It turns out that uh, looking back over 10 years, we would have been, that range would have been too low twice and too high once. Mm -hmm. um, and so we said, hey, that's, that's probably pretty good to, to really, um, again, drive home the point that we don't really know what that tax rate is when we're talking in April and we're just kind of presenting this, this as it's unknown, there's volatility, it's going to be somewhere in here, hopefully we'll be pretty close. Just so that the public will understand, this is a 10-year average on what the assessed value of the entire town is. So that, because that figure does not become known until August, and we're dealing with disclosure to the public and a discussion of a budget in the April, May, and June time frame. Uh, and therefore, this is all about trying to give as much information and as good a judgment as we can make in the May, June time frame for a number that won't actually be known until August to determine what the tax rate is. So, uh, this is uh, the point at which we'll have public comment on this. Anyone wishing to uh, speak to this matter may approach the podium. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. Why can't the assessor do his assessment earlier in the year? If you are working on something in April and he's not working on it until August, why can't he do it in February? And and I think when, when we finish public comment, uh, that's a question that's worthy of discussion, and I'll ask the town manager to address it. Others wishing to comment uh, during public comment session? Seeing none, oppose that, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Why don't we start by uh, answering the question yeah. that uh, Mike Turek asked. Uh, state law requires that uh, all assessments are as of April 1st of every year, and that's true across the state. Um, so there's a magical point in time of every year where the assessor kind of make, draws that line. Then there's a ton of work that occurs after that, all the pickup work for new properties. I'm not aware of any community that is able to actually uh, come up with that uh, earlier than the end of July, frankly. Um, I have talked to our assessor about moving it forward, but in all likelihood it would be early August. So in any event, that information will not be known at the time the, bud the budget is being discussed. Uh, it is, it's, not a, it's physically not possible to do that. It, it really, I've, I've joined uh, the town manager in those discussions with the assessor, and the body of work mm -hmm. that has to get done post-April 1st by the assessing department to get it all right and have it be uh, acknowledged as being properly done by the state really takes you into August. And, and therefore, it, it's, which is well after the time when we've voted, uh, the town council voted in uh, the May-June time frame, the referendum for the school vote is usually in the May-June time frame. So it's long since passed. Uh, have we had a motion? In we had a motion. Discussion. Uh, well, there, were, there were a couple suggestions since we since we started circulating that that formula. Um, uh, really, just for for point of clarity, to talk about what the formula actually applies to. 
Um, I was wondering if I could um, make an amendment. Yes, you may. All right. Um, so I, I move that we amend <coughs> so that we change the formula definition just so that it has a fourth, fourth line which reads, where the values used are the total property valuation assessed for the given year. Where are you on that? Uh, so if you look at the calculation at the bottom where, it, where it's defining what uh, it says uh, EV equals ending value, EV equals beginning mm -hmm. value, N equals number of years, we would then add a fourth line saying that the values used are the total property valuation assessed for the given year. Mm -hmm. So, so two questions, I guess maybe first one might be for, for staff. Uh, are there any other means or mechanisms that we're aware of to, uh, that communities use to determine valuation or is it just kind of the way we've been doing it? Yeah, I think it's a level of comfort and as was mentioned historically, I've always been terribly conservative in that estimate. Uh, I'd always uh, either under promise and over deliver, frankly. Um, and I think I've said as much every time I've been asked to, to comment early in the process, but I'm not aware of any hard and fast rule. This is, frankly, the most, um, uh, the, the, the clearest methodology I've ever seen talked about. We have a motion to amend on the uh, floor. I would request one a... Other, sorry, one other question, first, if I could, please. Um, just to Will for the, uh, the actual... We, we, once it's seconded, it'll be on the table and we'll have a discussion. I'll second Thank it. Thank you. Councilor Kays has a question. Yeah, sorry, it was actually was relating to the formula again. Um, Will, you made a comment before about um, determining or using uh, last year's number had more of an influence than the 10-year average. Um, I'm looking at the formula. Um, I'm assuming, I guess this may be a bad word, that the, at, that the beginning value and ending value are going to be, beginning value is going to be 10 years past, ending value is going to be last year. So I, I'm trying to figure out how sure. last year's would. Sure. So, uh, so an alternative to the compound annual growth rate, which would be, uh, would be like a, a average annual growth rate, where you would just say, you know, in year one, the average growth was 1.2 percent, and in year two, the average growth was 1.3 percent, in year three, it was 2.4. So you just have those numbers, and then you just average them. Mm -hmm. That's one way that you could come up with that average. Mm -hmm. a, a compound uh, average is assuming that there's compound growth, as in like you have a rate, and each year it's compounded by that, like a, like a like an investment in a stock would be. Like so, basically, it's it's saying, okay, I'm going to I calculate the next year by taking the um, the growth rate that I have and multiplying it by the the present value. So you're not, you're not calculating on percentage increases, you're calculating on gross dollar value. No, so it's a percentage increase of the gross dollar value, but you assume that that gross dollar value is changing every year. Did, that, did I clarify that at all for you, Chris? Yeah, no, you did. You did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions concerning the motion to amend? Uh, would council members like uh, one further clarification before we vote on the motion to amend? Uh, you okay with it? Mm -hmm. Okay with it. All in favor of the motion to amend. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, discussion on the uh, motion as amended. <clears throat> Further comments? Peter. Yeah, I guess. And again, I, I just want to make it clear to the public: this isn't all we're trying to do is to come up with a way that we can communicate out what the impact of the budgets <coughs> might be. It, will, it does not impact the tax rate at the end of the day. The, in, the end of the day, the tax rate will be based on the actual valuation. So we're no, all this really is is just a better way for us to be able to frame up the conversation to all of you about what impact we think the approved budgets, the budgets we're talking about, are going to have on you as taxpayers when it comes time. So it really doesn't change any of the mechanics. It's just a better way of trying to communicate to all of you where we, what the quarter of tax impact might be. So I Thank just want to make that clear. Thank you. It was helpful. Yeah, so I guess I'll echo Peter's comments a little bit as finance. Um, I, I'm always leery to, to put a hard, fast rule in place. Um, I think this is a tool. It's a guiding principle. It's not necessarily setting policy or, or a position in terms of we must do it this way. It's more of a tool for the council to be able to gauge where we think we're going to be and use that as a mechanism a mechanism for planning. It's not the end-all be-all. We can use other factors if we need to. So I'm willing to support this um, and see how it runs for a year or two as, as a basis to, uh, if we're accurate and it's the right formula and it's working out, then, then I think maybe we can keep it in place. But if, uh, if it's not working out after a year or two, I think we always have the option of 
of uh, changing it because it's not really binding us into one action or another. Other comments? If I could, I just want to underscore a point that Council Rowan made an introduction and the policy goes to a specific uh, language to speak to this, but the independence of the Office of the Assessor is rooted in statute. Uh, the mm -hmm. Assessor is appointed by Council. They are to act independently without political or even administrative um, influence. Though the Assessor answers to me day to day from a personnel point of view, I have no involvement uh, whatsoever in, in his work. Uh, and it's, uh, it's vitally important to have the assessor be totally independent. Um, he's got one of the toughest jobs in the town and, and needs to be above the fray uh, of any sort of influence. So uh, it just bears, it's worth repeating again that this policy does not impinge at all on his responsibilities. The, those are rooted in state law. And at the end of the day, what he says is, is rules, <laughs> not what the council mm -hmm. says in this regard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, it's important to understand this is a policy of the board, not an ordinance. Uh, if circumstances arose at any given budget cycle that caused us to believe that the application of this policy seemed inappropriate, that would be able to be on the table uh, for consideration. Uh, because. Right. At the end of the day, the objective is to be able to inform the public to the greatest extent possible as to what the likely scenario will be when the tax bills actually get uh, completed. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order, this is new business, order number 16-67. First reading and refer to the planning board for a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to rezone property located at 79 Muzzy Road from B3, a business district, to VR2, a village residential district, to TVC3, Town and Village Center. And I would ask the town planner, Dan Bacon, to introduce this matter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to provide a quick introduction and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Risbera because this is actually an application for a zone change um, from uh, Risbera Brothers, but it's come uh, through the town and the planning department and the Long Range Planning Committee. So um, what's before you for first reading is a zoning map amendment, and it's in the eight corners area. It applies to a property on Muzzy Road, 79 Muzzy Road, um, which is basically halfway between Spring Street and Gallery Boulevard, um, across from Siemens office and a few other office buildings. And it's at about 11 acres, and it currently has three different zoning districts that apply to it. Um, this is fairly unusual. There's uh, the Business 3 zone, which is a commercial zone, applies to it, and it's up on the, the map before you. Uh, a part of the property is zoned uh, TVC3, and that stands for Town and Village Center 3. It's a mixed-use zone, allows light commercial and residential uh, development, and then the back portion of the property is, uh, is zoned Village Residential 2, which is a residential zone. So uh, needless to say, when there's one parcel in three different zones, it can add some complication in terms of what the rules are and, and how a development project can kind of come together. And so there's, there's Bear Brothers have um, this property under contract, and they have interest in it primarily because of the TVC3 district, which applies to, I think, over half of it um, for multifamily housing, which is an allowed use in the TVC3 district. Um, so as the council expects with zoning changes, uh, this first went to the Long Range Planning Committee um, for an initial review, uh, initial vetting, and the Long Range Planning Committee looks at zoning changes from a standpoint as to how does this fit with the town's comprehensive plan? How does this fit with the Long Range Plan? Um, and they looked at it, and um, after a fair amount of discussion, mm -hmm. found that it does fit with the comprehensive plan. Um, this eight corners area is envisioned to be a neighborhood center and the TVC3 district really is sort of what the town uses for zoning for, for neighborhood centers. So the Long Range Planning Committee, again, reviewed it and provide a, provided a positive recommendation 
um, for the applicant to, to continue. They also recommended that before they come to you um, that they conduct a, a neighborhood meeting to, mm -hmm. to reach out to abutters and um, I give abutters in the neighborhood a sense for the project. So it's my understanding they've done that. I think that con was conducted in early October. I'm sure Rocky can, can speak mm -hmm. to that. Um, and now they're before you. So you should have in your packages the minutes from the Long Range Planning Committee, also um, the map that shows what the new zone would be. And I haven't brought it up on the computer because I don't know Tom's password, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have it in your, your packages. Um, but this is showing the three districts, and essentially this parcel is proposed to be one TVC3 district, which, ex which extends the right. district. Um, I don't know that we need to necessarily bring it up, but um, that's what I have for an introduction. I'll let uh, Rocky continue. So. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Rocky Risbera. I live at uh, 287 Black Point Road. Um, my brothers and I were quite excited to uh, be able to put this parcel on the contract uh, at 79 Muzzy Road. We feel it's a it's a wonderful site. Uh, Muzzy Road is an underutilized road. Uh, the site is obviously very handy. To uh, you can you can be anywhere in a very few minutes from from this location. So. We're pleased to get it under contract. It's currently owned by the Carrier family, um, but uh, we've had it under contract for just a short time. We've done uh, quite a bit of work in that short time. Uh, we're working with Northeast Civil Solutions, and uh, at this point in time, we've done a preliminary uh, survey. We've done a wetland survey on the site. Uh, we've had the DEP out and examined the site and made a field determination that we do have a stream and we have a setback we have to abide by. Uh, but that's all good information uh, uh, because we can uh, start our planning early on that. Uh, in, in looking at the site, it became very obvious to us that we had three zones. Um, I think the only time I've ever come to the council in Scarborough to ask for zone changes or, or any adjustments has been situations where I've got more than one zone on, on one parcel. And, and this piece is, is a little bit uh, odd in that regard. Um, of the, we have about 3.72 acres in TVC3. We've got about 3.81 acres in the B3 zone, and we've got about 3.56 acres in the VR2 zone. And so what we're uh, asking the council to do is to simply make the entire site a TVC3 zone. Um, that would allow us to move forward with uh, a multifamily project that we feel is very appropriate for the site. Um, this project would be uh, would be uh, one and two bedroom market rate apartments uh, as proposed. Uh, there'd be 72 units. If the entire site were uh, TVC3, it would allow us to build 72 units. We would do that in um, six buildings. Um, this is a uh, 12 unit building that we've actually been building uh, over in Westbrook now for a little while. Um, it's been very successful in the rental market. Um, and so we're, we're, uh, we're very interested in building that. Um, these units would rent for, uh, the one bedrooms would rent for $13.50 a month, uh, and the two bedrooms would be $14.50 a month. That includes heat and hot water. And our, our studies have shown that uh, at $13.50 on the one bedrooms, we're right on market, and at $14.50, we're actually a little under market. So that's uh, something that'll help, uh, help keep these full. We're seeing great demand in the rental market right now, and uh, our units in, in Westbrook are filling as fast as, as we can build them. Uh, we have a multifamily project uh, not far away from the Muzzy Road site in South Portland that we're going to be starting soon uh, that, that, uh, that will be very similar to this, this project. But uh, we feel that there's great demand uh, at this point in time. So we'd like to move forward with that. Our project would probably bring, uh, it was interesting, we are talking about taxable value, probably brings about 7 or $8 million in taxable value uh, to the town. And we know from experience that, that we really... Uh, will require very little from the town in terms of services. Uh, everything that we would propose to do, the roads, the parking would all be private, trash pickup would be all private. Um, and our experience has shown that we, we have uh, you know, very few children in these units because they're one and two bedroom, they're just not conducive to large families. So we really see that we would put very little strain on the town and feel it would be a good, uh, a good thing for the town. Um, Dan, as Dan mentioned, we did have a neighborhood meeting uh, right at the Baptist Church right around the corner from our site uh, on the 5th of October. 
uh, I believe we sent out 35 uh, invitations. We sent an invitation to everybody within 500 feet. And uh, we actually got a pretty good turnout. We had tw about 22 neighbors uh, mm -hmm. come to the meeting. Um, had some great conversation, uh, you know, good, good Im input from, uh, from neighbors, good questions asked. Um, no negativity at all. I was very pleasantly, uh, pleasantly surprised. I think that you know, people recognize that uh, if we can move forward with our project as planned, we can leave uh, a good buffer to the existing Honan Road neighborhood. Um, and you know, the Honan Road could, could just kind of continue to be as it is, a little, a little short dead end road. Um, our project would, would be of no harm to anybody. It, would, it really would enhance the neighborhood. It's a good transition from the residential to the, the B2. There's also some, in, some industrial land uh, sort of behind us. So it's a good transition. And so we're asking the council to support this uh, kind of cleanup of a zone, uh, zone change. And uh, we would uh, be happy to answer questions and happy to move forward. Questions of Mr. Rosero? Councilor Kaiser. Uh, first question is, is, uh, is there any particular sense of urgency moving this project forward? I have a great sense of urgency. <laughs> we, uh, we feel the market is now. Uh, certainly interest rates are, are very favorable. Um, so that coupled with, with demand, uh, we, we feel that we do want to move the, the project as, uh, forward as quickly as we can. Uh, if we are successful with, uh, with getting our you know, zone change and get all TVC3, then we'd, then we'd start the planning board process and go through that, that process. So uh, I would think you know, if, if everything went right, probably early summer would be, would be a time, t uh, time frame for us. Follow up. Follow up. Um, if you do not get this zoning change, what are your plans going to be? Uh, we're not sure. Uh, we really thought it made sense and, and thought that we would be able to get it. Um, we haven't done a lot of work in, in figuring out what else could be done. The project, the, the site is tough because of the three zones and, and at three, three and a half acres a piece uh, in the three zones, when you back out the TVC3 zone, I didn't mention that, but the TVC3 zone that exists today is almost all wetland. There's only about a half an acre of, of usable land. So it really becomes a really tough site with that stream <laughs> setback. Um, I don't see it as a commercial site, uh, not a real easy one at, at least. And uh, if, if we stayed with a VR2 uh, on the back piece of land, you really couldn't, you, you could extend Honan Road, but you really couldn't get enough house lots to really make, you know, make anything make sense out of it. So it's a, it's a tough site. I really think it needs, you know, the zone needs to become uniform to, to utilize it. Councilor St. Clair. Um, well, to me, two, po two points. Um, one, I'm always impressed when you come with all your homework done. Um, you know, neighbor notification is a big deal to this council. Um, we always want to make sure that everybody's well informed and they know what's happening. So that, to me, is always a huge bonus. Secondly, um, we, as you stated, and I think a lot of people know, we're in desperate need of um, rental properties in this town. Um, you know, we've been talking for years about we've got firefighters and teachers and police officers that can't afford to live in the town that they work in. Um, and so I think it's imperative that we get more rental properties in this town to be able to accommodate those people. So I see no problem with this proposal. And I'm hap I, the more I read it, the more I looked into it, the happier I was with the amount of work that you've already done. Um, you're coming before us completely prepared. So I thank you for that. Councilor okay. Caterina. Uh, yes, uh, as the liaison of the Long Range Planning Committee, I was part of the meeting that we had um, with the Rosweras, um, and a lot of really good questions were asked by Long Range Planning uh, when it was before them, uh, and they were ready and able and willing to, to answer the questions. I'm happy to hear you had your neighborhood meeting and you didn't have an uproar, no pitchforks and whatever. Uh, that's a good thing <laughs> when you have neighborhood when you have neighborhood meetings. Um, and I, I mean, I could I could get behind this. Could you talk, Rocky? I know I asked this before, and I forget the numbers. You pay an impact fee for every apartment, is that right? In the town of Scarborough, you pay an impact fee, or I'm looking at yes, we would. Yeah, uh, how much is it? Just so people will know, so the public will know. Is it eight hundred? Do you know the number? Enough to help Okay. So, 
Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And the impact fees are, are intended to offset school increases, correct? Increases to school well, or facility. facility? Okay, thank you. I just wanted that for the public. public right now. Other questions of Mr. Rosberg? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public uh, comment. Anyone wishing to address this matter from the public should approach the podium at this time. Hi, Marge DeSanctis, 54 Beach Ridge Road. Um, I think it's an excellent project. Um, I, I rode by just to make sure I was familiar because I looked at all the, all the things online that the council was able to get. I just wish that at least one building could be possibly affordable housing. Mm. Um, that would be the only thing that would make this more perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else from the public wishing to address this, this agenda item? Close the public portion and ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Councilor Kazem. So um, a couple questions for Dan, if I could. Um, can you give me a little history on why it's the three parcels are zoned that way? Was it uh, are they combining three parcels, or uh, it just you give me a little history there, or why they're there now? Sure. map will help the explanation. Um, the committee before the Long Range Planning Committee was named the Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee and has a lot of the same members. Um, but I think back in 2007, 2008, they looked at the zoning in this area and looked at the Comprehensive Plan and looked at the property lines and the parcels. And um, the Comprehensive Plan actually recommended because the comp plan was updated before Scarborough Gallery went in, that the mm -hmm. land across from Scarborough Gallery, and on this map it would be this way, towards South Portland, be industrial zone. <coughs> and when mm -hmm. Scarborough Gallery went in, the, the committee and the council at the time decided having industrial activities right across from Scarborough Gallery's entrance didn't make a lot of sense. You know, it really should be more of a business type area, a business zone. So. At the time, the council and the, long, the comprehensive plan committee decided these parcels ending right here should be a B3 zone that would match up well with what's happening in Scarborough Gallery. Um, and though this property is owned by one owner, on the assessor's map, it's two different parcels. So um, the committee and the council always looked at parcel lines and wanted to try to zone them the same and not have the situation. So that's why this parcel and all the ones going this way towards um, Postal Service Way, which is industrial, is B3. Not recognizing the joint ownership. Um, this parcel was zoned TVC3 because it's a long muzzy road and it's adjacent to other properties, zone TVC3, closer to eight corners in that little center. And that area was viewed to be appropriate for light commercial, like the pizza place that is there, the church, you know, small commercial, and then housing, some multifamily, two-family, single-family housing. So that's what TVC3 allows. So that's why this parcel, or this part of this parcel was zone TVC3. The back piece, wasn't zoned TVC3 because we didn't know this piece went with it. Um, and it's at the end of a neighborhood. And so the feeling was if this area is going to be developed, it shouldn't, commercial shouldn't creep back and be right next to a single family neighborhood. So the feeling, and also all uh, this land is zoned this residential zone. So the feeling was to protect the neighborhood and for if any development's going to happen here, it should be residential if it's going to connect into the road. So that's a long answer, but uh, that's why it's three different uh, zones to, to try to relate to what's happening around it as it was viewed at the time. Uh, further Does comments help? or questions? Uh, Councilor Kazan. Yeah, I guess. Um, 
Dan, could you get into maybe just very quickly um, what the potential uses are as they exist now? Um, I know Mr. Rizbera stated that he doesn't, they haven't really explored that very well, but uh, or not since they're very well. They haven't explored it yet. They're hoping to go obviously with the first option, and I understand that completely. Um, what are the potential as it sits there now? Under the current zoning? Under the current zoning, yeah. Under the current zoning, the B3, which is the red, allows commercial development, non-residential development. So retail, restaurant, um, office related type uses and you know whatever could fit there in terms of a building and parking, recognizing there's a stream and some other mm -hmm. things could happen there. Um, the TVC3 allows light commercial and multifamily housing but based on their wetland delineation not a lot's going to happen there unless they're getting significant environmental permits uh, to do something. And then I think as Rocky suggested, the back piece, this residential zone, um, there could be, you know, some single family, two family, some amount of residential development. I, I haven't looked at it enough to know how many units could, could go in there. It would, you know, likely connect to Honan Road or, or maybe a loop out to, to uh, Muzzy Road. Good. Other comments, questions? Yeah. Obviously, Katarina. Um, just uh, through the chair to Mr. Caiazzo, um that part, we talked about this at length in the long range planning and I know that uh, a couple of the members of long range planning, myself included, that TVC portion is mostly wetlands, there's not much you can do with it. So the way that uh, the Resvaras have this set up, you know, we were pretty excited that that could p just stay, you know, sort of as an open space, wetlands undisturbed, um, which would be fine, you know, with, with part of this, particularly since you're going to see a build out over time of that whole section. I mean, that's the intent of the comprehensive plan. So, it, you know, to me, even from just a real estate point of view, it makes a lot of sense to have this type of a development in this place because it is a transition zone into then this very small neighborhood that does, then goes into the so-called village that at, at some point, ideally, you're going to have walkability there, you know, walk to Joe's walk to, you know, the Eight Corners Market or whatever. Um, so that's part of the, you know, looking at the big picture. And I believe there's a restaurant that I looked at, you know, going in across the street. And, you know, there's a lot of things happening over there, so. Thank you. Other comments, questions? I would say that there's, I guess, three things that impress me about this. One, the property's in one owner, uh, mm -hmm. and we really try to avoid circumstances where we're splitting up a property. At the time, it wasn't appreciated, but now it is uh, in one owner. Uh, the portion that is TVC is not insubstantial, but it's wet, uh, but it's there, and, mm -hmm. it, and but for the wet condition would be ripe for this very project. Uh, and three, it meets a need. Uh, I think that is something that the comprehensive plan has identified and something that we as a council have supported uh, to, to get more of, uh, housing that can meet the needs of people who we'd like to both work and live mm -hmm. uh, in Scarborough. So further comments or questions? Chris. Yeah, so uh, my biggest concern, honestly, with this is the, 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 the wetlands that are around there. Um, we've got a lot of runoff. We've, we're, we're, there's uh, the Nonsuch breweries going there. That's the backside of the Nonsuch. Um, you know, we're trying to shoehorn a lot of development into a, a, a very heavily mitigated property. Um, I, while I appreciate the outreach, I'd like to hear it for myself, to be honest with you. Um, that's just me. Um, so I will certainly support this as a first reading with the hope that if there is any concerns or questions in the community, now's your chance to get out and come back and say something <coughs> now and then. Um, I would <coughs> like to see a little bit more, uh, I mean, market rate is nice, affordable mm. housing is better. <laughs> Um, I'd love to be able to see some kind of uh, discussion with planning to see what the use is going to be or how we're going to be able to get that usage in there. Um, it's a lot of pavement in my mind um, and having just been in that neighborhood uh, walking around, it's, it's a, it, it, I think it's going to be a big impact on them in terms of 72 units going in right next to them. It's going to change the dynamics of that neighborhood quite a bit. If they're comfortable with that, so am I. Uh, but I'd like to at least give them the opportunity to come up and say something. Other comments? 
Councillor St. Clair. Um, we've been talking for years about the fact that we need additional affordable housing. That's always been, you know, something that's been on the minds of every councillor that I've ever worked with. Um, but I think there's sometimes a slight misconception about how difficult it is for um, these contractors to build affordable housing. The state of Maine does not make it easy um, on towns and contractors to bring in affordable housing. And so I think when we talk about it, we have to be really mindful of the fact that we're making <coughs> progress. We're, we're, we're trying. We're, we're getting, if, we, if this, this passes through, we're finally getting another larger project that at least is bringing us down to market value, and then we keep attacking it. You know, um, and that's un the, the most frustrating thing of this whole thing is it's not the contractors that don't want to build affordable housing. It's it's a very complicated process to get affordable housing in here, um, and so I think we have to be mindful of that when we talk about it. Uh, and maybe as this is something that we need to have more conversations about so that people can understand what goes into bringing affordable housing into certain areas. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a number of levels at which, you know, affordable housing is just a phrase, uh, uh, and a lot of people associate it with uh, uh, when there are a portion of the payment is being made by third-party source, uh, special financing and, and whatnot. But when you have rental properties, that in itself has an affordable housing element to it. And when you have one and two bedroom houses at these rates, it has an affordable element to it. So I think that probably ought to be kept in mind. Councillor Katerina. Um, if you notice the notes from long range planning, I, d I did bring that up. I specifically asked Rocky about affordable housing, particularly for seniors, uh, because I know that's a real need uh, in this town. Um, and, you know, I think, again, this, remember, this is going through a whole long process. This is just the beginning. This is just an initial step. There's a whole planning process and whatever that will go on with this. But I think they're great questions, and I think they're things that should be addressed. Councilor Rowan. So I think something else to speak of and when we talk about affordable housing is, is even the market rate. There's a huge demand for, uh, uh, for, for housing in the, in the greater Portland area, and just to be able to add to that housing stock is going to help reduce that. <laughs> Uh, that price point. Councillor Gaza, then Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify my comments. I'm not opposed to the housing project in terms of the units and, and rentals. I think it's a great opportunity anytime we can do that. I don't like the location. I think it's too close to the wetlands, and I think there's, uh, uh, you know, that's a pretty uh, um, delicate area in there behind the Nonsuch, which does empty out into the marsh, which all feeds in. I think Red Brook's right nearby there. That's a stream uh, that we've talked about needing special monitoring or something like that. So I just want to make sure, I'm not saying it's not a good project. It's location, location, location. That's what I'm concerned about. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think I'll just echo kind of Councilor Chiesa, just, just from the perspective of, you know, as we try to become more transparent, make sure the community is aware of things that are going on. I know we've reached out to some that are immediate sort of adjacent property owners. We'll just kind of echo, as, as people have heard this and they've heard this conversation tonight, take advantage of the next couple of, before this comes back for the second reading, if there's any concerns, let us know so we can kind of listen to those and factor them into sort of our decision making. So thank you. Thank you. And for the public's benefit, this goes to the planning board, uh, which uh, is uh, very seasoned at, at giving, scrubbing these kinds of projects uh, to determine their merit and value. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Order number 16-68, first reading and schedule a second reading to approve the charge for the ad hoc public safety complex building committee and authorize the town manager to expend monies from the public safety building capital improvement account and an amount not to exceed $50,000, and I'll ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, uh, staff had presented in a workshop format to council uh, about six months ago a long-range facility plan, and in that plan you may recall that a public safety building, a combined uh, police and fire public safety building, uh, was the highest priority, and that's kind of been widely appreciated and I think understood. 
for quite some time. In fact, uh, this town studied this in some detail back in 2007, conducted a feasibility study, uh, but that project really hasn't gone any further uh, in the 10 years since. The needs continue uh, with, uh, with <coughs> stretching our limits uh, in the current combined facility. And so uh, really with the, the backdrop of the long range facility plan and the understanding that this will probably take close to a year to do uh, what I suggest we task this committee with, um, we think it's important to at least get this process started. And so what I've prepared for your consideration tonight is uh, uh, an order that would uh, provide a little history and, and context, uh, create a very specific set of charges or tasks to this group. Uh, it provides for the composition of the group, and it also it enables this committee to have some resources available. Uh, certainly there are some staff resources that will will provide, but there's also financial need to hire qualified consultants to help them uh, meet the tasks that are listed here. And it's probably worth noting uh, what I suggest in terms of deliverables uh, would be a full site selection evaluation uh, to not assume anything, even what was discussed uh, in 2007, that's kind of background material that will be important for them to appreciate. But I think there needs to be another look. We're 10 years further uh, from that uh, last evaluation. Um, and that ought to consider uh, both public and private property, in my opinion, uh, just to make sure we've been thorough in that analysis. Uh, then to start to get into the details of space needs in terms of police and fire, what do they actually need currently, and also some understanding and accommodation for future growth. Uh, that would likely involve the, the resources from an architect uh, to help you know, really understand and focus in on what those specific space needs are. Then uh, to move to the schematic design phase, uh, I would envision uh, building elevations uh, but, and also kind of uh, initial lot layout um, so everyone can really get an appreciation for what's being recommended. <coughs> and then finally, um, provide a probable cost estimate. All of this, I believe, is really essential for us to build the case uh, which ultimately the voters will have uh, to consider. And I think each and every one of these pieces will play a, an integral role in that. Uh, I'm recommending the authorization of up to $50,000. Um, really, I don't have any specific proposal to back up that number. I think, frankly, that might be low. Uh, in most projects, soft costs typically are 12 to 15 percent of total construction costs, which uh, in all likelihood, when we're all done with full architectural, it's probably going to be closer to 200000 But I think this will certainly get this committee started um, engaging the consultants, and I guess they would this also provides um, an opportunity for them to come back and request additional funds should they need that. Um, so I'm pleased to answer any further questions if you have. Questions of the town manager? Councilor Rowan. I'm wondering if you could, uh, in the, uh, the order, um, there's a section on membership. Um, I wonder if you could talk any, any about that. And the, yes, I the beg your pardon. Already filled. Um, yeah, I beg your pardon. Uh, we should take a step back. I convened. Uh, staff meeting and, and kind of talked about the best way to approach this. I, I really marveled at the success of the Wentworth Building Committee. That was a some 35 member committee and I must admit at the time they proposed that I said it's going to be a colossal failure. I don't know how they can possibly do it so big but uh, really because of ex uh, excellent leadership and a very sound committee structure they were extremely successful. Um, I've kind of reconsidered and I, I think a kind of a leaner meaner smaller working group more of a task force. And there are a number of folks here, uh, certainly representatives from both the police and fire department, I would suggest be part of that committee. Um, I would think it would be a good idea to have a member of council to be a sitting member on that group. And then I really want to tap on some of the local expertise we had. Uh, Mr. Rosbera is in the audience. Uh, they are legendary in terms of their um, accomplishments in, in the commercial building area, and I think um, his expertise would be invaluable. And the other individual represented or mentioned here is uh, Mr. Bruce Bell. He lives on West Beach Ridge Road among uh, a very successful career uh, in Portland Public Works. Uh, Mr. Bell was really the, the lead project manager that built Hadlock Field. That was kind of his uh, crowning achievement in his position. Uh, he's also a longtime call member of the fire department uh, and longtime resident of town. So um, that's why we've presented these names to you today. The final piece I should mention, typically one of the, this sort of action would be a single read, but because it uh, includes 
expenditure of monies. Uh, it does require two readings. And so I, I would expect in the intervening weeks between now and your next meeting, and when you consider this in second reading, we will have uh, recommendations to fill in all those blanks. Um, and I know Councillor uh, Donovan has already begun to receive interest. And I think we'll try to make sure that that information gets to all seven of us so that we're really <coughs> pretty current. When we come to the November meeting, uh, we'll have a much better understanding of what the composition of the committee will look like. Chris. So um, uh, I, I certainly don't mind having an ad hoc com committee to explore the needs and the wants. Um, my concern is that when we get cost analysis, I, I would prefer to see uh, at least a professional group brought in for a bid evaluation or some kind of RFP pr pr proposal procedure, something like that. I mean, I certainly, no one can address the needs of the facilities like the police and the fire chief, and, uh, but I just want to make sure I understand what the goal of this ad hoc committee is. If it's to come out with a <coughs> schematic and a blueprint and then put it out to market, um, I, 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 I would may want to see a little bit more of an independent group, let's say, evaluating the the, uh, the feasibility and the constructability of it in terms of the design needs. Are there other ideas out there instead of kind of, um, in a normal construction project, there are engineering companies and other architectural firms that are independent and out, outsourced to look at it from a specific, or Trigen's a prime example. We had a owner's engineer, let's say, for example, that was a, a, an independent uh, third party group that came in on our behalf. So uh, if we're going to talk about getting to a design phase and we're going to go out for cost analysis and things like that, I'd like to see that be a secondary step, if it were, and maybe have this ad hoc committee, uh, the, the, the purpose of this committee is to sit down and discuss needs, wants, desires, locations, that kind of stuff. Is, I'm okay with that. Uh, I just think when it comes to final designs and, and costs, we may want to look at bringing in an independent consulting or engineering group that may have other ideas that we haven't thought of in-house. Perhaps I didn't make myself yeah. clear. I, um, my expectation is the end point of this would be to supply the council with sufficient resources and detail and confidence to seek voter approval. And uh, I believe what I've laid out here will provide you with that level of detail. Uh, as a technical or practical matter, uh, when I talk about engaging qualified consultants, there would be a, a competitive open process. We'd go through a selection process. I've not identified who those would be. We would look to match up, um, you know, select those consultants that meet our needs the, the best. Um, I don't expect to have full-blown architectural plans at the end of this. That that, that would be something I think we would um, engage after the fact that we had confidence the project had voter approval and it was definite at that point. Don't say. Yeah, I guess before we talk about this specifically, I, I guess my my question is and. You know, this is kind of a new, we really haven't talked much about this proposal. I just kind of, it's, it's come, but I know in the finance committee, there's been a lot of conversation around, you know, we did do the needs assessment for the municipality side, and we identified 48 million or so of, of needs going forward. We also, though, haven't gotten an answer for what are the needs of the school side, it, because there's there's been some conversations that there could be an equal sum of money that they are saying they need for that. And, I, and the Finance Committee, we've had a lot of conversation about, okay, we have an existing level of debt. How do we take a look and prioritizing how we fit these capital projects into the process? So I'm just curious how this has kind of, is gaining traction, because a lot of times once you start a process, it's kind of self-fulfilling. So I'm concerned about, we, we don't know what the needs of the school side are, so how can we prioritize which one of these projects we're going to start staffing and funding to come to conclusion? And I just don't, I thought we were on a different pathway to have kind of a strategic plan to get there. So I'm just kind of surprised that this is now being brought forward as the one that we're going to start. So I'm just, I'd just like to get a little background on why this and what, how are we going to address the school side and some of the other things that we know are still out there but we don't have any, any details for. Well, we've been waiting for over a year for the school to provide that, that information. I'm, I'm told just today that actually they, they have some of those details. I'm not, I've not seen them yet. I think that's something the school board's going to be addressing in December. Uh, but frankly, our need, this need was documented 10 years ago. And um, I, I guess I am somewhere aware that there's no immediate pressing need of the school. I don't want to speak, speak on their behalf. But 
Uh, they are certainly well aware. I've shared with them our long-range facility plan. They're well aware of that. Um, I, I'm not looking at pushing anyone out of the way, but my job is to advance when I think we need to address town town needs. And I, and I, I think we now. did we did hear George say that that they had gone through an analysis that concluded last spring, and that there was nothing that they were going to push forward in the five near term uh, near term uh, in the next five years. Uh, I sat at a meeting at which I heard him speak in those terms. So, and, <coughs> and we were teeing up library, municipality, uh, schools all spring, all winter and spring long to get a sense of yeah, where right. were the priorities. And so the school is as conscious as can be that this is going forward and that they have chosen through their own good judgment, their best judgment, that they are not advancing it on any schedule that they wish to have us take into account uh, uh, with the public safety building. Councillor St. Clair. Um, maybe I'm the, the lone wolf here, but um, this, has been this has been talked about. I talked to the chief about this when I first started six years ago. Um, I took a tour my very first week after being elected to the council um, of their building, and I was mortified for them. Um, and it's not just an aesthetic <coughs> issue. It's a safety issue. I mean, there's safety issues in that facility. Um, and heaven forbid something happens to one of our officers or somebody that we've arrested because there's an issue with the building. Um, I, 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 for one, am thrilled to see this on the agenda finally. Um, I, was, I was surprised to see it. Um, I didn't know it was coming at this point, but that being said, I'm happy to see it. I think it's a need that is desperately um, needs to be addressed and taken care of. Um, we have a duty to make sure that our officers are well protected, that they are in a building that is um, clean. I mean, I, I know this is a very small, small example, but the, the chief of police has a has has a, has a, um, drain pipe. a drain pipe going into a trash can through his window. I mean, the, this is Scarborough. I mean. I understand that to some people, they're like, okay, that's not a big deal. And in the grand scheme of things, maybe that's not the biggest deal. That's one tiny problem that they're having in a very, in that building. And there are, you could come up with sheet upon sheet upon sheet of issues that are happening in that building. This town is growing, and we have to meet that need. And I think when people, and I, I know that there are people on this council that can attest to this, you know, we're 20,000 people and growing community. Um, and it, it bites when we have to spend money on things like this, but it's a necessity at times. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of people out there that don't want to be the one that, if you're having a heart attack, I know I say this every year at budget time, you don't want that ambulance taking 25, 30 minutes because they couldn't get out of the building. So these are, these are legitimate needs that have to be addressed and taken care of. Thank you. Town manager, questions before we go to the public? Mm -mm. Uh, any member of the public wishing to address this matter, please go to the approach the podium. Thank you. Joan Laurie, 21 East Grand, Scarborough. Um, my only concern is, uh, um, and Tom sort of addressed it, um, I'm not sure that the committee should be that small. Um, I think I was on a committee to plan the park that's adjacent to the Lighthouse Motel, and there were, I think, 10 of us on that. <laughs> and this is like a multi-million dollar project. So maybe a few more people, not necessarily people with... Um, backgrounds in building or you know we have the fire chief and the police chief and that's perfect but maybe a few more citizens um, on that ad hoc committee would not be a bad idea thank you thank you John others wishing to address this matter oh uh, Larry Hartwell 9 Puritan Drive uh, I agree with the chairman's synopsis of, of the discussion about the library and the schools and and uh, the capital needs of the town I think that discussion is 
is accurate the way you portrayed it. Uh, and in the few years I've been around here, there's been a, a, this discussion about the needs of, of the first responders. And as uh, one of the councilmen just said, uh, it's been discussed and discussed for years and years. And I think it's at the top of the list and, and a committee should be put together to, uh, to move forward on this. Um, a qu question I have is on the composition of the, of the committee, or actually with Mr. Rosbera. I wouldn't have known him until he, only because he's here tonight. And I have nothing against him. I don't know anything about building. Uh, that's the last thing on my list of things to know. My, the reason I bring up his name is uh, he's being uh, a part of this committee or a resource in this committee. And tonight he was before the council and he's before the planning board and, and other uh, boards in town. And uh, just a perception, a potential perception of a conflict there. Uh, I have nothing against him, no malice or anything, but just, uh, just my observation on that. I just wanted to share. Thank, Thank you. you. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. Uh, I understand that uh, there is no pressing need for the schools in the next five years. Uh, you may want to listen to the school superintendent tomorrow night at the school board meeting. It's my understanding that uh, that will be part of the discussion. Uh, I don't know what she's going to say, but uh, you may be interested in it. Thank you. Others from the public? Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Caterina. Um, having listened to people from the audience, I had some of the same opinions about membership. Um, I could see it being expanded. Perhaps you have more than three residents at large. I was a little concerned to see these names already given, like that Bruce Bell, not, nothing against Bruce. I know Bruce and I know his background and whatever, but it's already preconceived that he's going to be on this, as well as nothing against Rocky Rivera in the back row, but you know there are other construction companies, construction experts in town. so. I absolutely, you know, you want to have the fire chief, you want to have the police chief, but I think you, in my opinion, you should be opening it up to see who may want to apply for the different uh, um, positions that you're offering. Uh, Tom, speak you to the to issue of perception and Mr. Rosbear in particular, and I, I don't want to speak for him, but we did have a conversation. Frankly, this is tremendous community service because effectively his participation on this uh, would preclude him from bidding on this. So uh, I, I don't think there's any, sh none of us should have any concern that right. his involvement is anything other than true community service. In fact, um, some might suggest it's a bad business proposition, frankly. <laughs> um, I, and I beg your pardon, but I was in, in an effort to kind of move this along with the assistance of staff. We we're trying to come up with whom we thought would be good representatives to contribute to this cause. And uh, I hate to have uh, names put forward in them. Um, Perhaps it's, it, it may be best to remove all names and take the next two weeks and right. consider this further. It's first reading, so I, I mean, I think, uh, Chris. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I, I would concur with the comments that have been made about uh, composition. I think as unruly as the Wentworth committee was at the end of the day, there was no question it was a full-blown community engaged process. I think the best we can do to mimic that um, would be to our benefit, uh, getting as many people involved as we possibly can. I know it can be unruly, but if time is not of the essence and we have to have something on the board by next year or something, uh, I think the more involvement we can get, community involvement we can get, the better and the easier it will be to finally uh, get approval for that from the public because we will have shown that they've of all had pretty much a voice in the decision-making process, or at least in the planning stages of it. So I would certainly advocate for the committee. Uh, I would hope that we could, even keeping, I don't even mind keeping the people in place, but maybe broadening the composition up to, to uh, a larger number of citizens uh, in, in some shape or form. And, and, and I'm sorry if I could just finish that. Mm -hmm. The need is clearly there. I don't think that's really yeah. the question of the debate. I think it's, again, like everything, it's how we approach this and how we do it. Uh, in my mind, 
this is a clear and pressing need for the town. It's been one for a while. Uh, when it comes to establishing the priorities as we talked about, this is right up there, for sure. And I think this uh, discussion gives the, uh, uh, all the town council members the opportunity to consider where is the sweet spot for size. Right. Uh, I don't think we need to decide that tonight, but that I think input to the town manager, he and I will talk, uh, I speak with each member individually uh, in, in the interim period, uh, and we'll get further input. We'll see if we can establish something of a consensus around what it, what it should look like. I guess the only thing would be helpful is if you could actually uh, indicate the total size, and then we sure. could endeavor over the next several weeks to, to try to meet that need for you. I mean, time is not as of, of the essence, but by the same token, uh, I would like to get the project uh, moving forward. Councilor St. Clair. Um, my, I, I agree that maybe we could we could add maybe a couple more community members. Yeah. I would just caution you on the size of this. This is just the, the this is just the initial committee looking at this. This isn't like full blown planning committee. Yeah. I can understand where that would be uh, maybe a bigger size committee, but I think a smaller committee when you're doing the type of work that this is outlining is going to be more effective and get a lot more done quicker. And then when we move to the next stage, I think that's when you bring in as many people or whatever size people decide to do. I think you have to be, it's a fine line between too many people, too many hats and the, I can't even think of the right analogy anymore. But anyway, um, but I do, I agree. I think we could definitely go up on the size of the committee um, but I would just caution that I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mm -hmm. go much higher, um, only because the scope of the work that we're talking about for this first proposal is not what I think. There's a little bit of a misconception about what that scope is. I think your point is this is not a building committee. Correct. Mm -hmm. Chris. Well, I, I would just like to point out that one of the deliverables is the schematic design and the probable cost statement. Um, that sounds an awful lot like a conceptual design committee to me. Maybe I, mis maybe I misunderstood. I don't know. So if we're going to use that number as a basis to make a decision to move it forward, then I would suggest that we do try and get as much involvement as we can, uh, or we adjust the deliverables for the committee. Personally, I think I, those deliverables are essential if, yeah. um, essential prerequisites before we go to the voters. And it is conceptual. Uh, uh, this is not a building committee where, we're, where we've got an architect uh, and, and we're getting down to uh, construction plans. There's a difference. Other comments? I, I guess I guess that's the way I, you know I'd support this on a first read, but I would love as as I think suggested from the audience, we do have a new superintendent in place now. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to get some confirmation that in fact there won't be a, a significant capital request for the next five years if that's what we're basing the decision on. So that piece would just be an important piece for the second read, I think, to make sure there isn't something that's out there. So if that's possible, I'll certainly check in and report back on that piece. I, you know, and maybe the sweet spot here is enlarged, but not unwieldy. And I, what I was thinking was uh, double the number of residents from three to six, mm. and double the number of town council members involved from one to two. Mm -hmm. uh, and we already have two council members who have indicated an interest. So. I think while that's a demanding task, uh, I think it would be, uh, we'd be able to fulfill it. And that would be a total committee of 11. Yeah. Odd numbers are good, though I don't expect any. And know, if that sounds issues. like the right spot, I'll entertain a motion to amend. So moved. Second. Discussion on the motion to amend. I'm sorry. Discussion on the motion to amend. No, I agree with you. I agree. Hmm. So do you want Maybe to make it clear what you're amending? <laughs> yes, we're, we've changed the composition from three uh, residential members to six yep. and one council member to two. Okay. Any further discussion? Chris? I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, I, I think that will uh, certainly open it up to um, others out there that may have different approaches to this, for sure. Good. All set to vote on the motion to amend. 
Mm -hmm. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, discussion on the uh, motion as amended. Everybody had their say? Mm -hmm. uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Non-action items, none. <clears throat> Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, we'll start down there with you. Sure. Uh, so uh, Jessica stole my thunder a little bit on my uh, <laughs> lesson. Um, but I did want to thank the, uh, the Affordable Housing Committee and, and uh, uh, our chair, Craig Ferguson. Oh, oh my, what did I say? Affordable. Is that affordable? Oh, Historic. my goodness gracious. Historic Preservation <laughs> Implementation. You know where it's going. Thank Long you. Long night. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the, the cleanup at uh, the King Memorial and Gravesite is, was fantastic. The pictures are great. Um, I haven't been down yet to check it out, but I'm definitely going to take my kids down. There's a really nice plaque there. Uh, it's a really nice hill. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embellish with a little bit of my own history lesson. Um, <laughs> that uh, it's interesting, what I found interesting was that, that um, Richard King was not terribly popular um, mm. at the time. Um, when the Stamp Act was imposed in 1765, his neighbors burned down his barn. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but his... his Patriots will do that. <laughs> but his, his children, it, so he was from away, but his children were all born oh, in Scarborough. He had, he had a, a total of Ten children, uh, and uh, and the, the three notables are the ones that Jessica mentioned, and, and uh, we should be proud of all of them, the sons of Scarborough. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing to note about historic preservation is that uh, the Greater Portland Landmarks had a ceremony a couple weeks ago, um, in which the uh, uh, town of Scarborough was uh, recognized for the restoration of the Danish Arch, um, which is a remnant of hotelier uh, Henry P. Rhine's popular U.S. Route 1 motel and attraction that authentically replicated the Danish town of Ribe, pardon my butchering of the Danish, <laughs> um, while sadly most of the village was demolished in 1976, the town of Scarborough um, works with the site developers to acquire, relocate, and restore this historic fragment of its tourism history. We commend the town of Scarborough for its renewed commitment to recognize and preserve Scarborough's significant historic resources. So, uh, well done to the Council of Time and the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee. Thank you. So I have. Councilor Katerina. Uh, you heard about uh, long range planning and again we're starting to work on the comprehensive plan, the new comprehensive plan, and how that's going to be implemented. Uh, the Conservation Commission, I was not able to attend their last meeting. We're meeting tomorrow night at 7. Uh, they've had preliminary meetings regarding the um, sea level rise. Speaking of which, I guess the clam bake was a little flooded yesterday due to high tide. So that's kind of like a precursor of what could be coming. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll be getting a report back on meetings with Public Works. But what they're doing is we're meeting with uh, each department head just to talk about what are we doing in the case of. Um, so. That's it for me. For yeah, thank you. Yeah. Kate? Oh, um, yes. The appointment committee met tonight, and we have some um, people to list. Um, for the planning board, our recommendations are to move the first alternate, Roger Beely, to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2017. Move second alternate, Robin Sand Saunders, to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2018. And then first, the new first alternate position would go to Rachel Hendrickson, and the second alternate position would go to Richard Dupere. I hate when I do that with people's names. Mm -hmm. Richard Dupere, I'm going to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, Coastal Waters and Harbors, there, we had no applications for that, so what we did was we moved some people around. Um, we moved first alternate Erica Downs to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019. And we moved the second alternate, Maura Erickson, to first alternate with a term to expire in 2019. So this still leaves us with one vacancy on the committee. It's a second alternate with a term to expire in 2019, if anyone's interested <coughs> in that. That's it for me. Thank you. So that'll be the posting for those <coughs> nominations. Peter? 
Yeah, a couple things to report. The Shellfish Commission, Conservation Commission met on the 11th. They have elected a new slate of officers. Dave Green is chair. Vice chair is Robert Willett. And just a point of reference here, he's actually served as chair for the past eight years, so kind of a big vote of thanks to him and for all his service and work. Treasurer is Tim Downs. Secretary is Erica Downs. Um, th that was that. The Coastal Waters met. They met uh, also on the 11th. Um, really not much to report. They are trying to get rid of some of the old dinghies and things down there. They've had people put names on them. They are going to be removed and stored down at Public Works for anybody that hasn't claimed them. Um, I thought it was interesting. As folks know, last year there were some concerns on the water. There were some you know, paddlers and kayakers mm -hmm. that got caught in some of the currents. This year, the harbor masters reported there was some additional signage put up, and they tried to move the launch areas for some of the recreational users. Good news is there really were no incidents this summer, so that it did create a safer environment down there, which was great news. Um, and then the third thing that did meet was the senior committee just met on the 18th. Um, and again, just kind of a, a Folks may not be aware, I just thought I'd kind of let folks know, Martins Point, who is moving into town, who's building a big center right across from sort of where Main Main has a center, but they've, they've dedicated it to about a 2,500 square foot room um, that they're making available for a lot of community activities. So in particular, the seniors, um, they're starting to move a lot of things. They're going to do all their lunches there. There's kind of out to lunch crowd, 10 to 2 every Wednesday is going to be moved there. Um, Tuesday and Friday will be senior drop-ins there. Monday night they're going to be moving mm -hmm. bingo. So Martin's Point's making a huge commitment to the community. So kind of thank you for that and they're welcome to town and I know the seniors are kind of appreciating that. I guess it's a great facility. There's a mini kitchen and some other things. Everything's included, chairs and all the things they need, TV systems and other stuff. So that's kind of it from my perspective. Councilor Gaza. So um, Energy Committee did not meet this morning in spite of my showing up at 7.30. <laughs> the were good though. Yeah, okay. you, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> so that was my, completely my error, of course. It usually is. Uh, so we'll be meeting tomorrow. Uh, same bad time, same munchkins, although those are probably gone. I'll have to replace those. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe uh, Dan's going to come in and talk to the committee about um, the comprehensive plan, how we're going to structure it, and the role of the Energy Committee in, in helping to move that forward. Uh, from the school perspective, uh, they met on October 6th. Uh, the key takeaways from that meeting were they um, adjusted all their year-end financials for FY16. So they're, I believe, completed and ready for audit, much like we are or are in the process of doing from the municipality side of things. Uh, no major surprises there from my perspective. Um, it seemed like it was pretty much the same old culprits, um, which could be controversial, but uh, you know it doesn't seem like there was any anything major there. Um, and then they did also approve the contract for the Board of Education, uh, for the, excuse me, for the uh, teachers' contract, the uh, Education mm -hmm. Association. Um, there was a comment this, this uh, evening from the podium about doing uh, their workshop tomorrow night being about facilities. I'm not aware of that. I have the agenda in front of me. Um, two issues I think that are of of note are the NIAS committee is going to be established. That's the accreditation committee mm -hmm. for Scarborough High School. It's a long process. It's very time consuming. Uh, it looks like they're getting ready to nominate that committee um, with co-chairs and members. And also uh, the workshop session is going to be an analysis of the 2016-2019 Scarborough Education Association's collective bargaining agreement. So. Uh, I'm not sure to the level of detail they're going to dive down on, but hopefully that may answer some of the questions or concerns that were um, raised regarding the uh, questions or the contracts that are put out. Um, I, I'll save my comments for Thanks. council comments. Town manager's report. Yes, uh, a couple quick things. Uh, I hope you've noticed uh, an increase in our communication efforts. Uh, we've tried to have a, a more of a presence in social media lately. Um, if you have any feedback in that regard, by all means, pass that along. We also have been doing, I think, a better job, more comprehensive and consistent with our uh, monthly e-newsletter. Yeah. Uh, Karen Martin has kind of breathed new life into that, and there's a great committee that helps support and produce content for that. I think it just went out today with yeah, the, uh, the issue. I hope you find that useful. Um, we've also been working on a uh, what I'm calling a council orientation packet. I think Council Rowan is the one who suggested during your uh, goal setting session last fall as a new counselor that would have been nice to have kind of an onboarding packet. So we put together in a PowerPoint format um, all the 
relevant pieces, we think. <laughs> uh, but undoubtedly, it'll be a work in progress. Uh, I'm close to having it be, being confident to send that around. I may circulate it, and you can provide some feedback. If there's some areas that we haven't covered, I'm pleased to add them. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to report uh, with 9 Partridge Lane. This was a dangerous building, oh, you may yeah. recall. Uh, we worked with, well, we tried to work with a homeowner. Unfortunately, there was really, there was zero cooperation. Yeah. So in the end, we, we uh, just this week, we did uh, demo the property. Oh, okay. uh, before that, uh, it remained with its contents full. Um, uh, we did have the police department um, go through, and they secured three rifles and, believe it or not, nearly 17,000 rounds of ammunition. Oh, um, the facility had been secured during the entire time. We made sure of that, uh, and the police department, thankfully, properly uh, destroyed a, uh, those weapons and, and ammunition. Uh, so the site, if you go by it today, I have a picture of it. It looks pristine, kind of a beautiful fall picture. <laughs> um, like it never happened. And clearly the, the residents have noticed uh, the, the phone is ringing this afternoon uh, with a number of folks inquiring whether the land's for sale. Oh, or yeah. Sort of thing. So I, I'm, I'm sure they appreciate the effort. Uh, we are looking at the horse beach permit ordinance. Uh, this was in response to a resident expressing some concern with uh, folks that have lawful permits not following all the regulations. Uh, we are conferring with Old Orchard Beach because this is a cooperative uh, program with Old Orchard. So. We hope to report back, and perhaps the ordinance committee, when it's reconstituted, can take this matter up. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, I just want to mention that uh, we have finally hired a sustainability coordinator. Uh, her name is Carrie Strout. Uh, Carrie uh, has a BA in environmental science and policy, and a master's of science in resource management and administration. And currently, or most recently, she's worked for Avant Grid Renewables, the, the second largest wind. Mm -hmm. uh, producer in the country, and she's been involved with the project as an outreach coordinator in Vermont. And uh, before that, she was with Klein Schmidt, which is a uh, international um, engineering firm, and she was a coordinator and outreach person um, on energy projects. So she comes with us with a great degree of experience and excitement and energy, uh, and she'll be starting at the end of November. So. Um, I know my staff and many of the committees are very anxious to have her on board to really start to move some of these initiatives forward. So with that, just end of November? Yes, November 28th, Monday. Uh, she really had to wrap up a, a project that she's on and, and we Great. are accommodating. Thank you. Did, uh, can, I, can I ask for one question? Please. Did, did you want to add a, an update on Carpenter's Court that circulated today? Yeah, the good news is uh, another property is under contract, uh, so I think it's the third, as I recall. There are two others that at least the foundation's in, so they, to my estimation, uh, have exceeded the the uh, expectation of build out. So their their pace is actually quicker than they had expected. Uh, I think that all works very well. Uh, I know there were some inquiries from members of the housing alliance in terms of how that's how it's working with selecting um, uh, buyers. Um, and perhaps we could have the folks from Habitat come and attend, uh, even a council meeting if you like, but it, at the very least the Housing Alliance to give us a direct update. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Start down there with you, Will. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so I know there was some uh, talk of affordable housing uh, <coughs> earlier on the agenda, so uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, mm -hmm. the good news about affordable housing in town. Um, I just have one comment. Um, I wanted to thank the police department and, and uh, Chief Moulton for putting on a, a terrific to-do um, this past weekend, um, and a special thanks to, uh, there was a Nordics fundraiser for Operation Hope. Yeah. Um, it was a trunk or treat event. Um, my kids went down, we had a great time, we got to explore some of the vehicles. Um, and uh, a big thank you also to the Nordics employees, their friends and their families that, that came out to, um, to volunteer. Um, uh, Project Grace and Steffi Cox and, and the fire department as well. They were so well re represented. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Councilor Katarina. Well, you stole my thunder on that one. No, <laughs> I went to the Operation Hope uh, a fundraiser also, uh, and I wasn't able to get there until the end of the day, but it's from by all reports, it was a lot of fun. People had a great time, and... Uh, <laughs> it was nice to see people getting together to help others uh, the way they did, and, and again, special thanks to the Nordics for doing that. Um, a couple things, elections are coming up on Tuesday, November 8th. Uh, absentee ballots can be requested until when, Tody? <laughs> 
November 3rd. November 3rd, Thursday, November 3rd at 5, well, office closing four. at 4 o'clock. Uh, so you can either come in and vote here or you can take an absentee ballot home, but you can't do it after Thursday, November 3rd at 4 o'clock without having a reason. Um, uh, voting will be at the high school. I, you can check in if you're interested in working as an election worker. Um, I, we need to do an update and find out if we need other people. But <coughs> as part of that, I just wanted to express to the public my extreme, extreme frustration and disappointment at listening to the talk of rigged elections. Uh, having been uh, both from our governor and from one of the presidential candidates. Uh, I've been a deputy election warden in my past life here in town for a number of years. Um, I've, been, I've worked at elections my whole adult life uh, as a volunteer or, or paid election worker. And um, it, it, it just irritates me and upsets me to no end that people f would think that there are, there's anything like rigged elections. There are so many safeguards in place. You have people from both political parties overseeing, you know, the taking of ballots, the counting of ballots. There are all sorts of safeguards in place. So um, I, I, I just needed to say something about that. And uh, if you know Todi, uh, she's there from probably one in the morning <laughs> of election day until the last ballot is packed and ready to go to Augusta. Uh, it's a long, hard day, and she and her crew do just a fabulous job. We have a reputation in the state, I don't know if you folks are aware, of probably having the best, some of the best run elections in the whole state. Uh, and we also have one of the largest voter turnouts in the state. So come, vote. If you don't vote, don't complain. That's it. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair? I'm good. Yeah, I think I'll take a little different tack, but also thank Todi. And we're talking about elections and ballots, and I know her, her and her team have been very busy. There's a really heavy <coughs> sort of turnout so far, and, and that's really what I'd like to talk about. I've heard some rumors, and, and when you look at the national elections and some of the things that are happening, there are some rumors here, even in our town, that people are concerned about being at the polls because of safety issues and violence and other things. And we can't do much about what happens nationally. We certainly can do something about what happens in our community. So if that's true, I just really appeal to everybody out there. We need to think there's been a lot of effort this year to try to get to a place of greater <coughs> civility, greater respect for different opinions about things. But being able to vote safely is critical to our country, our way of government. So for all of us in our community, if people are feeling that way, I, I encourage everybody to think about how can we change that dynamic because that's, that's really, really, you know, whether you're, whichever party you are, the fact that people are afraid maybe to come out and vote is just a real deep concern we all should have. Thank you. With that. So just a couple things I neglected to mention in committee reports, I, although I'm not a liaison. Uh, Jim Elkins had asked me to distribute these. You have packages in front of you for um, uh, the Thri Greater Portland Thrive 2020. Uh, 2020. <coughs> That's the United Way effort, I believe. Councilor Donovan, Councilor Katarina, and I were at the library, I think, several months ago uh, when we kicked that off kind of brainstorming session. This is the next phase of that. So Mr. Elkins asked me to share that with you. So um, just kind of an update kind of thing. Um, wanted to extend my congratulations to the couple that got engaged at the um, uh, gazebo today at sunset <laughs> in a ring of flowers. I thought that was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful tact. I wish I'd thought of that when I did it, but um, <laughs> I, I hope it was successful. It appeared to be successful, so I wish them the best of luck. And it's always nice to catch glimpses of that stuff in town, as uh, instead of. Uh, all of the, uh, the angst and, and divisiveness that may be coming with the political season. So congratulations to them. I don't know who they are, um, but uh, I wish them all the best for sure. Um, and last but not least, um, there were a couple comments tonight from, from the audience about school issues and school activities and stuff. And I, I know um, it kind of goes without saying, but I just wanted to remind us all as counselors that uh, while it's good to hear those things and, and be aware of those things, uh, that's really not within our purview to be able to do, to, to do anything about that. Um, I certainly will report out from any um, uh, anything I've gleaned from tomorrow's workshop session on the contracts, um, but certainly if there are any questions or concerns from a council perspective, please either you know ask me as the liaison, or certainly the <coughs> chairperson is very approachable, uh, the school board chairperson, and I'm sure they would answer 
whatever questions we might have as well. So, um, and last but not least, I wanted to thank Chairman Donovan. Um, e even though we we, uh, we we may sometimes feel up here or or even look like we're we're at loggerheads or at issues, um, he runs a very tight ship, and I wanted to appreciate you letting everybody. Uh, get their word in and their points in, and at the end, um, I think we, we, again, are leading by example with compromise, and, and I thank you for that. For sure. thank, thank you. It's about getting to the right place. Exactly. Uh, uh, I went to my first Scarborough Education Foundation uh, <laughs> silent auction. They had a big event at uh, Bailey's Campgrounds this weekend. Sure. It was terrific, and uh, I just want people to know that it's a fun event. Uh, there's music. Uh, Don Campbell Band was really great, uh, so uh, congratulations to them. A lot of effort uh, uh, goes into that. Uh, uh, we did a fireworks uh, survey some time ago. We've kept it open. It's now kind of petered out, uh, but uh, there was a fairly <laughs> as large a response as we've ever gotten in a survey. So uh, and. There was not an insignificant amount of concern expressed. So without trying to count the numbers, uh, it seemed to me that it was time to have a listening session, uh, a workshop, uh, and an opportunity for the seven of us to all say what we're hearing from our neighbors and friends and whatnot. And I'm going to have that scheduled for November 17th. So uh, we'll have a, a, at least one, maybe two new counselors at that time. So. Uh, they'll obviously be invited to that round, round table discussion. Um, the Low Income Senior Property Tax Relief Program <clears throat> had a deadline of Monday, uh, and from getting a report from the assessor at Sturgis, uh, Sue, the assistant assessor, it was an enormous success. Awesome. Uh, we had peaked in 2012 with 300 plus applications accepted. Uh, that had gone down to 107 uh, as of last year. Uh, just a dramatic loss of funding for people who had come to expect uh, mm -hmm. this sort of support from far back as 2007. Uh, this year it went up to 280 nice. uh, applicants uh, were approved. Uh, and the report was, uh, and I'll shout out to Craig Friedrich for making it simple, it worked. <laughs> they were able to do it with a degree of simplicity that was fantastic. Uh, and even a couple of uh, renters qualified. And hmm. this is 62 years of age, 10 years, uh, and so uh, it had the sort of flexibility that we were hoping it would. Craig and I are going to work on some amendments to bring those forward in the months ahead to see if we can make it even better. We're going to sit down with the assessor and the assistant assessor and try and understand that. But really uh, quite a terrific outcome. Um, last but not least, uh, 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 we, I was invited to the soft opening of O'Reilly's Cure. Very gracious offer. I went, <laughs> saw some of the rest of you there, and a terrific start for what looks like a wonderful beating place, greeting place, and I survived it. Being Irish, that's a surprise, <laughs> but uh, I did, and so uh, welcome welcome to town. Uh, and with that, I'll accept the motion to... Uh -huh. Second. Thank you. All in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>